And welcome now to uh, what I'm pretty excited about. Uh, I'm glad you all are in this class. And this is going to be a, such a fun three weeks. And I, I hope you're not regretting your decision already after seeing all the workload, but it's going gonna, it's gonna to be a lot of fun. And part of what we have for our, uh, for our class is our textbook. And our textbook is uh, Mobile and Social Media Journalism, a Practical Guy by Anthony Adornado. And he is joining us, as a matter of fact, right here virtually uh, from... Uh, you're in Ithaca right now, or is that where you are right now, or where are you? Uh, yes, no, snowy Ithaca, where it's, it's freezing. And so that's okay. <laughs> Kansas has been kind of chilly. It's not quite Ithaca. I know I've got uh, family from Ithaca, so uh, I, we've, we've been there. Troy, actually, is, uh, is also where they're, is kind of where they're from, so it's not yes. too far away. Um, Thanks for thanks having for me. Thanks for joining us, Anthony. Appreciate it. Uh, tell us a little bit about uh, your background in television and as a reporter and kind of how you kind of came about this uh, this confluence and what got you interested really in this confluence of uh, social media and news, which really has only been around about 10 years or so. Yeah, I mean, I uh, walked into a newsroom sixth grade, totally hooked. Uh, and from that day forward, I kind of knew the career path I wanted to take, um, which I was fortunate uh, to find that passion early on. So then did my undergrad, uh, got out in the late 90s. You know, at that point, when I was got out into television news, I worked at a bunch of local markets. And even in the late 90s, um, the website meant one static web page for a news outlet, right? So, like, it was really an afterthought. Like, you were still focusing as a TV reporter. I was still focusing on my product for the 5 or 6 o'clock news. And actually, at that point in the late 90s, not even contributing to anything on web. So then throughout the course of my career in TV news, reporting, anchoring, you know, you saw the evolution of technology. Uh, I think, you know, before social media, it was yes, more robust multimedia on websites, and it was blogging maybe as part of that as a reporter. And then we've now uh, since seen that explosion of uh, social media, which has kind of turned everything on its head, uh, so to speak. So for me, um, I've always been fascinated by new technology, how we can use it to serve the audience because right at the end of the day, yeah, we work for an outlet, but we're really working for the public. Um, and so uh, I've always been an early adopter. And so with my teaching and my background in news, um, that kind of led me to this, this course I teach on mobile and social media journalism and then subsequently writing the book on it. Uh, let's talk a little bit about what, what you just said, that really journalists in particular serve the public. And going where the public is. And I think that was the evolution really of the of social media being linked into news is going to where the audience is and getting them where they consume. And I, I think that that was really that big shift in mindset, uh, which came, oh golly, probably about eight years ago, the digital first mindset. And that was really revolutionary in the way that news is now done and gathered. Yeah, I mean, listen, like we as journalists need to meet the audience where they're active. Like we can no longer sit back and say, oh, we're producing this content and they're going to come to us because everyone knows like the audience has a million different options. So I think it's a little bit arrogant to think even if you produce and have the best content that they're just going to come to us. Um, we really have to go out there, meet them in those spaces, social media, the web, particularly social media now and on there build kind of this relationship with them, hoping that at the end of the day, we build that trust and that they will turn to us and look at our stuff uh, more frequently than, than elsewhere. So I think that's key. And, you know, previously prior to social in particular, like if you think of like how decisions were being made, it was a very top down. So like we in the industry think we know what the audience needs to know and we're going to make the decisions what we now know like the audience is an active part of that conversation of the stories we tell now. There's a lot of downsides to that, too, that we can talk about, but it's just the reality that we're confronting now. Well, and that's part of what we want to talk about as well, is you mentioned there are downsides of the way that journalism is now being um, positioned, if nothing else, into the, into the public is, you know, one of those obviously being that uh, you, there, the thinking process has now been shortened for journalists in particular. So for those who are creating and presenting and, uh, and investigating the news, suddenly it's not, we'll see at six o'clock or at 11, suddenly it's, we'll see in 15 seconds on, on social media, which has led to a little bit of a different culture. How have you seen that culture changing amongst journalists and, and the product they're putting out? 
Yeah, I mean, I think, uh, you know, we all know that, like, it takes time to do good journalism. Um, and that, like, is a complete contrast in a lot of ways with, um, with this kind of overflow of information. We need to get it out right away. And so I think that's the biggest challenge um, of, like, how do we take a step back and do good journalism, knowing that, that we still have to be active on these spaces? I think part of it has to do with educating the public on what we do. And I think that's where social media comes in, like letting them in on the process of news gathering, right? So like, it takes a while to fact check, fact check, check certain things, right? Um, here's what we have to go through in our news gathering to actually get the story right and fair and balanced. And I think that's where social media can help out in that, in that process. Um, but I, th I also think at the end of the day, um, you know, this, I hate when people say everyone's a journalist now. And I pose that question to my students like the first day, like, how would you respond to someone? <laughs> and then I go into my thing. And I say like anyone, everyone can publish something online, but that doesn't make them a journalist. So I think, with the, the flood of misinformation and information, that's where all role is more important um, because we're actually trained in kind of providing context and, uh, and verifying stuff. And I think that's, that's absolutely a huge piece of this is the user generated content has now become a, you know, for lack of a better word, a viable piece of news gathering, but still there is a journalistic responsibility. We had an interesting situation uh, here in uh, Manhattan in the fall, Bill Snyder decided, as a football coach, decided to retire. And there were a lot of people over the, the weekend that it was kind of coming together as a story that said they knew and they knew that was going on. They were getting angry at the news organizations for not calling it, so to speak. Where some of the news media then came back and said, hey, look, we'll, we'll call it when we confirm it, that Bill Snyder was going to probably retire. And there were a number of users who were starting to get a little bit antsy saying that they knew that this was coming, they knew it was going to happen, and how come the news organizations didn't call it? Why didn't they say, hey, it's a done deal? Whereas some, then some reporters kind of came back, and, and some of that interaction became, hey, look, nobody's going to know if Sam or Jim or Alex doesn't get this right, but everybody will know if our news organization does. And we really have a responsibility to our viewers and our readers and those who rely on us to make sure we get it right. So we don't want to steal from that, um, that journalistic process just to be fast and just to say we're on social media. It's got to all work in concert with each other. Yeah, I mean, that's why I always say it's like uh, the old school meets the new school and how do they mingle kind of thing, right? Mm -hmm. Like the old school journalistic values, how do we apply those to the social media uh, platforms? Um, and yeah, everyone will, you know, you'll hear it when you're wrong. You know, you might not hear it every time you're right. You won't hear it every time you're right, but you'll definitely hear it um, when you're wrong. So that's, um, it's a tricky balancing act. And like to the point of user generated content, I mean, I think that particularly in breaking news situations, I think that's where things have really changed of like, there's, there's a, you know, use the miracle on the Hudson I talked about in the book. That was kind of like a turning point plane, emergency landing, Hudson River, New York City, News crews aren't there yet, but guess what? There's a ton of people around there who have mobile devices who are snapping stuff and, uh, and sharing it on, on social. And this was, you know, 10 plus years ago or whatever it was. And so that's changed the game because now we have this content out there we can search for. That's one step of the process. But then it's like once we have it and we found out what's the second step in terms of verifying it, how do we go about doing that? Yeah. Second step, obviously, get Tom Hanks to star in the movie, and then we'll all be then we're all there. We'll we go. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's talk just briefly, um, and again, we'll we'll be discussing this throughout the class uh, as well. And, and uh, students who have the book, they're gonna and and we'll read it. But um, let's just talk basic best practices and kind of where the effective pieces of the social media are going right now. Uh, we're still in a Twitter Facebook world, I think, with with news. Um, Snapchat, obviously, uh, the the younger generation is really loving Snapchat. I think the news organizations have been very slow to embrace and just don't know how to use it well enough and effectively enough to do that. So let's, let, first, let's just talk, let's talk about Twitter. So best practices for Twitter on uh, how often the students should be on Twitter, how or, or news organizations and journalists should be on Twitter, and how, how is that message different than the other messages you're giving? Yeah, I would say, right, so uh, you got to speak the language of the platform. So for Twitter, it's definitely more frequent bursts. So 
it wouldn't be strange for you to be posting, you know, tweeting five times a day, retweeting or whatnot. But, you know, uh, think about the quality of stuff you're putting out there. I mean, for certain, when during the recording process, if you're going out reporting, you should be taking along the, the viewer, the social media, your followers along in that process. Um, that helps to obviously tell them about the story uh, across social and hopefully they'll stick with you across that whole span of your reporting. But it also helps build your brand, right? As a reporter, it's like future journalists, communication professionals, like, ah, I know how to use these tools in a professional journalistic way. Um, with that, I would say, and I think this is for all the platforms, is uh, I, I like the 80-20 rule. So like 80% of the time, keep it professional. But the other 20, don't be unprofessional, but let people, <laughs> give them a little kind of like in your life, right? Not that you were out like drinking Saturday night, but like that, okay, I'm training for a marathon or my parents visited this weekend because that stuff really speaks to what social media is all about. It's social, right? So if we're just like pushing out stuff in this one directional way and not letting people kind of into our life and giving them a personal yet professional look, uh, then it kind of defeats the purpose of it. Uh, yeah, and I think that that is important as well with that relationship, that that social piece of that, that there, there's a much different relationship now between journalists and their viewers, readers, consumers than there was in the past. Even when I started, you know, back in the early 90s, uh, it was, I'd get, I'd still get letters, people that, if someone was mad at yeah. me, they sent me a letter. <laughs> I mean, You're all. Right. Look at that. I know, right? I know. Look at that. It has a stamp on it. Look at that thing. What's that in the, that's, uh, and so that, I mean, that, that was, you know, think about it. Those who are now, especially the students, those who are watching this, uh, when was the last time you got a letter in the mail from somebody except your grandmother or grandfather? Uh, but that was that was pretty standard, and then suddenly they found email, and we started starting an email. Now it is everything is so instantaneous to where I would get off the air and then check my Twitter feed, and somebody would make a comment on my shirt or my hair or my tie, or you know whatever, what, or maybe even what I said, maybe even my content, which was great. Uh, but that also became a very different uh, connection to the viewer as well, where they felt like they knew me, and so they trusted me in a different way than just seeing me on TV all the time. And I think that that personal connection with the consumer has been a big difference. Uh, you mentioned that the 80, 20 rule and trying to let people in there. Does that uh, also in your estimation help keep them as viewers and consumers and get them to, uh, to really understand your own personal credibility? Yeah. I mean, I think that, um, it's part of getting them, and Hallie Jackson, I interviewed for the book with NBC News, she talks about getting them under the tent, right? Whether it's my tent or whether it's the NBC brand tent, where she works for NBC, of like, you know, particularly the younger generation we know are not watching traditional news like the baby boomer generation. How do we still get them to come to us for the information, the news, no matter the platform, right? And I think that's part of being active on the social spaces of, building this trust with them, knowing they can rely on you. If it's social, if it's TV, if it's the web, wherever, for whatever story you're covering. Um, but they definitely, I think it, um, you know, it works in our favor as journalists are can because we finally have a two-way street that we can kind of build that relationship where before it was very one directional, you know, it wasn't like uh, a back and forth, a conversation we were having um, kind of thing. Uh, we talked Twitter. Now, Let's talk space. Yeah, what's that? I was just going to say now, this opens up a can of worms because like you alluded to, like you're going to be sometimes interacting with people uh, who want to talk about stuff that like in non-journalistic ways, right? Like your haircut's horrible, your shirt's horrible, you know, all this kind of stuff. And, and then it becomes like, when do you engage and when do you just step away, right? <laughs> mm -hmm, right. And, and again, and that's, you know, no different than when you're, you know, you go and shopping and, and people like real people come up and you actually have real conversations. You got to kind of figure out where those boundaries are going to be and where you're going to, where you're going to find those. Uh, let's talk about Facebook real quick. That Facebook has quickly become the number one distributor and redirector uh, for news organizations. And, and some studies, study that I did a couple of years ago, um, you know, found that some, some 70%, 70 to 80% of all news traffic that's running through websites is coming off of some form of social media, mostly from Facebook. Now that has been uh, then hijacked in the last two, three years by those who want to do more harm than good to the journalistic profession. Um, as a 
journalists that were using Facebook, what are best practices for you for using that platform in particular? Yeah, so you're right. I would say, you know, students this generation, they're not into Facebook. They think it's like an old person's platform. But as you mentioned, all the data shows that like in newsrooms, that's where the majority of traffic is coming from uh, referrals to news websites. So it's key to, to know that Facebook is still a key player in this process. Um, the big thing now is, uh, of course, Facebook Lives. Ton of traction with that. Um, so I always recommend experimenting with that because anytime you can pay, take a person like to the scene of where you're reporting, right? Before we used to have to roll in live trucks or sat trucks. Now it's like, okay, I got this, and this is kind of my this is my live truck. And so anytime you can take someone to the actual location, that's that's um, that's great. Um, and then also just in terms of Facebook, so lies, but I would say posting less frequently. I don't think it comes as any surprise. Like the language of Facebook is not to be posting constantly throughout the day. Um, even, you know, uh, let's say you're covering a story. It's not necessarily a platform that you're going to definitely not continuously um, sharing throughout the day posts on Facebook. Um, one might be okay during the reporting process and then kind of the finished product, getting it out there. Um, but take a step back with Facebook and don't post this frequently, I would say. Students in this class are required to be using the Facebook and Twitter. Most use Snapchat, not required necessarily for here. Snapchat, though, has proven to be a little bit more difficult for news organizations to co-opt, to, to really figure out how to use it to its best ability, other than individual users, reporters, or, uh, or things doing that. Why is that more of a platform problem? Is that a generational problem? Is that just a, an actual material problem that that's been a little bit clunkier getting going? Yeah, I think it's a combination of stuff. I mean, one, we do know that the younger demographic is on, um, is on Snapchat. Um, so one, it, 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 you would think logically is a great place to engage them. But I guess the question becomes like, are the younger generation are going on to Snapchat, but are they going on it to um, consume news? And even if they aren't, how do you, once they're on there, get their attention to swipe over or follow us or whatever, you know, if a reporter or outlet is on Snapchat kind of thing. So I think that's, that's one aspect of it, of like, um, is it worth putting our resources in that, even though the younger generation is on them, when um, it's not clear they're actually, when they're on there, going to consume any sort of news. And then two, I just think it's, um, it's also the issue of uh, where do we want to put our resources? So like, if we know Facebook and Twitter, right, are like uh, giving us the best thing for a buck, and at the end of the day, we have to choose, does Snapchat make sense? And I think Snapchat now, too, there's a big question mark because Instagram has taken a lot of, particularly Instagram stories, has taken a lot of the characteristics of Snapchat stories. And there's a much broader break on Instagram versus Snapchat. So I'm seeing a lot more places would rather put the resource on Instagram versus Snapchat. And I think, too, as you, as you look at those, some of those have been co-opted nationally. So if you, you, know, you already have your news feed, quote, unquote, it's not your news feed from your local TV station or local newspaper. It's a, it's an overall news feed, you know, the guardian, or it's a, you know, a, a larger contracted news feed that, uh, that I think with Snapchat, a lot of, uh, a lot of users are used to having that, not necessarily getting, Hey, what's happening in the city council race, what's happening in the, you know, things that would affect them actually uh, versus clickable material, which is a very different, Thing. journalism and yeah. material are not quite the same thing obviously so uh, so that makes a so that makes a big difference um, uh, what's the best way that you found to just to, to have fun with this stuff and just to be uh, be able to um, you know use it in, in, in a way that uh, that makes sense for both sides yeah I mean I think um, and that's the thing I think you gotta like experiment with Serious stuff was also a little bit more laid back. So like, I always like to tell my students, like they always have to go out with like a kind of a plan before every story, right? That they're reporting on of like, you're gonna cover that, like uh, you're gonna cover it that way, but how are you gonna cover it for social? What are the best platforms to use for that particular story? Um, you know, could it be uh, Facebook Live kind of thing? Could it be that you, you're, you're sitting down with one of the people you're interviewing and actually doing a Facebook Live with them kind of type thing. So I think that's key and then, so, based on whatever your story is, whatever you're covering, actually coming up with a plan, like, yeah, of course it's gonna change, it's journalism. 
but try to be very like, intentional about what you're doing so you have a clear cut plan in place. And then two, I would say, um, think about how you can build in like uh, how to share your own personality. So this could be that, for example, you are uh, sharing kind of, okay, what the cool stuff you're reading lately, the cool stuff you're interested in. Okay, I, you know, I'm training for a marathon. I'm, uh, I don't know, I'm taking a cooking class. You know, my nieces and nephews are driving me nuts today. Here they're all piled on me. Like, it might seem silly and dumb, but to be honest, I have my students do this. They look at their analytics of like what got the most traction over a certain period of time. And oftentimes it's those lighter hearted things because maybe folks don't expect that up in their feed or it's coming up less frequently in their feed because you're typically sharing stuff related to traditional reporting. Yeah. And they may say, hey, great. Thanks for the information on your informational news tweets. And, but they may actually like the fact that you're playing with your nieces and nephews, which is a different, right. different ways that people use these platforms socially. And I think that that's, uh, that's part of figuring that out. Anthony Adonato, thank you so much, man. appreciate you uh, joining our class for this time. Thanks for having me. Have fun on that social media journey. The wild, 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 I call it. Yeah, right? Yeah, it, and it should be a lot of fun. Okay, everybody, thanks so much for joining us today. Appreciate it.